Ruiz. Welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. G.X. Wolfine, musicologist, creative arts journalist, and multimedia pro. Whether you're watching the video version of this show or the audio-only podcast version, I thank you so much for your continued interest and support in this show. If you enjoy this programming, there are several ways to help support Truth and Rhythm, as well as contribute to further enhancements and expansion, plus get some sweet perks and rewards in the process. First, subscribe to the Funkin' Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives, and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Second, join Truth and Rhythm's new membership program through Patreon, which features three tiers for truth believers, truth seekers, and truth crusaders. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkinstuff.net. At that site, which is loaded with awesome content, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide of Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funkin Stuff merchandise and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. Sponsorship opportunities are available as well. Contact me directly at scottg at funkinstuff.net. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. I'm delighted to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership innovative musician and producer Michael Beinhorn. Since collaborating with experimental bassist producer Bill Laswell in the late 1970s through the mid-1980s, he's played with or produced an array of diverse and creative artists, including Brian Eno, Herbie Hancock, Nona Hendrix, Lenny White, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Soundgarden, Aerosmith, Ozzy Osbourne, Living Color, Soul Asylum, Black Label Society, Hole, Marilyn Manson, and Korn. For the past several years, he has focused on helping music artists develop and realize their potential. And in 2015, he published the book, Unlocking Creativity, A Producer's Guide to Making Music and Art. Michael, thank you for joining the show. How are you? It's a pleasure. I'm well, thanks. I hope you're the same. So where are you joining us from today, Michael? I'm in British Columbia right now up in Canada. Beautiful area. Yeah, I'm on Vancouver Island. It is, oh, it's one of the most gorgeous places I've ever been in my life. It's amazing. I love it up here. I love it too. I'm from Los Angeles originally. And so I went up there, you know, a couple of times and whew, I was definitely one of the areas that I considered relocating to when I came out here to Charlotte. It's just so gorgeous. What brought you to Charlotte? Just, uh, I was looking all over the country for a place to move that would be more family friendly, more affordable. And mm -hmm. I hated to move away from the entertainment industry because it's in my blood, but, uh, you know, sometimes you got to make that move. Uh, yeah, the entertainment industry can get a little too entertaining sometimes. Yes, yes. I'm not missing Los Angeles myself. I, I hear you. I only miss it because, you know, you get a better shot at uh, musical artists that come through the tours. You know, of course, not during the pandemic, but in general, um, you do have a better chance to see somebody in Los Angeles than in Charlotte. That's very true, yeah. Yeah. So we well, you don't get much of that up here. So you'd have to go to Seattle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or Vancouver. They have good shows in Vancouver. So are you a skier? I'm not a skier. At this point in my life, I think that could be potentially very dangerous. Yeah, I've, never <laughs> skied. I, I've never skied in my life. Yeah. That's, yeah. it's a little late for me. I'm afraid my son might wind up there, but, uh, 
It's not going to be me. Uh, I just ask because I know Whistler is just beautiful too up there. And I was there. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing. I think I, I'm sure we'll wind up there at some point. Well, excellent. I'll be well, watching. <laughs> Again, thank you for doing this. I've been a fan for a long time, a very impressive uh, career and, and credits. And I can't wait to dig into it here. Thanks. Looking forward to it. So Michael, um, going back uh, several years, uh, more than either of us probably care to think about, but uh, where are you from originally and how did you develop musical interests and what drew you to the synthesizer? Uh, I grew up in Forest Hills, Queens in New York City. And uh, I, uh, you know, I, I grew up surrounded by music. I mean, my parents are both avid music fans. So I was kind of inundated by a lot of classical music. And then as, as I grew up, they got into the Beatles and stuff like that. And, you know, I just, I followed suit because their, their limit, their range of music was actually kind of limited. Like there was, they, you know, they, they were sort of, my mom was kind of orth, had some kind of orthodox kind of prejudice against like bands like the Rolling Stones. So you know, I think that the the Beatles were more sort of, the, the, there was more strong emphasis on melody. And I think she could relate to that because of her interest in concert music. And uh, that was pretty much the atmosphere I grew up in. And I just got interested in synthesizers when I was very little because I, I saw pictures of these instruments and I was like, what is that? And then I heard one of those switched on Bach records when I was really small and it just kind of blew my mind. Like the sounds on it were just so otherworldly and I'd never heard anything like it, you know, plus obviously Wendy Carlos was using reverbs and, you know, and, and wasn't using delays, but just, I think things that were inbuilt in, in the uh, Moog system. And I, I just never heard things, instruments that were in that, kind of context process that way and it just absolutely blew my mind so from that point on it just it became like an obsession for me like a real fascination with synthesizers and electronic music sounds in general and were you aware of you know like what stevie wonder was doing in terms of just doing everything on his own at that time and with the uh, help of margaluff and those guys and uh that tanto system i didn't have any context for for any of that like I would hear Stevie Wonder on the radio and I'd be like yeah that's cool but I only found out about all that stuff much later on I had I mean the concept of recording was something that I just didn't I didn't have any contact I didn't have any context for it at all I didn't understand what it was I didn't understand how records were made and I just all that sort of came to me as I started working in music you know, one of the first uh, real synthesizer sort of um, innovators and exploratory guys that I remember back then was a guy named Tomita. I don't know if you ever came across any of his oh, music, yeah. but yeah. I, uh, I got his uh, version of pictures at an exhibition by Masorsky when I was about 13 or 14. And I just, I, I loved his stuff. I mean, I, I didn't, go far into his catalog or anything like that. And I didn't check, like, I didn't know, for example, that he'd actually done a lot of scoring for movies and TV shows in Japan. Uh, I think he actually scored a, um, oh, the, what's the, 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 the blind swordsman. I can't remember. Uh, oh yeah. I, you know I what I'm talking I, about? Yeah. Ah, I, this is the problem with having like a four-year-old, like your brain just kind of goes blank at the wrong times. Yeah, uh, it'll, probably, it'll, <laughs> probably, it'll, it'll probably pop in before we stop talking, but okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he scored one of those, I think, you know, he'd been, he'd actually been pretty successful and he'd incorporated synthesizers and a lot of electronic keyboards in the stuff that he did. And, but yeah, he was a, in, he was an extraordinary innovator as far as the way he used, I, I feel like he kind of stepped up the game from where Wendy Carlos had taken using the Moog systems because his his usage of electronics was just, I, no one's ever done quite the same thing that he did. He was absolutely remarkable. Yeah, very avant-garde at the time for sure. Yeah. Um, 
So uh, what course of events uh, or path led you to connecting with a uh, Bill Laswell? Well, I would go down to the East Village to these record stores and kind of, cause I was really into really, I was into really obscure, weird European prog rock type stuff uh, when I was younger. And I started seeing these leaflets all over the East Village that had been pasted up on sides of buildings, lampposts and things like that. And on it was uh, an invitation to uh, go to this place on West 24th Street, this guy's house, which as I found out later, belonged to this guy named George Ogromelsky. And Bill had actually made these leaflets. And he kind of posted them up all over town. Really, he was trying to recruit people to play in a band. So myself and uh, my friend Fred Moore, we went down. We went to 24th Street and met with these guys. And after a few weeks or month or whatever, we just started playing together as a band and started working together. And that's really how it happened. What year about was that? That was 78. And... Where would you rate your musical ability at that point? I'm non-existent. Uh, I've never fancied myself as much of a musician. Uh, and it always bothered me for a long time. And then I finally came to terms with the fact that I just never really, I actually never wanted to become a musician, which is one reason why it's so funny that I wound up being in a band. I actually enjoyed using synthesizers very much and I loved programming them and I still do, but I never liked playing live. <laughs> it just wasn't anything that I, I was really bad at it too, if, you know, if we're being perfectly honest. I just, I've never been a compelling performer. And in hindsight, I just, I decided, well, I should just own that. I kind of suck, <laughs> but it was, no, but it was fun. It was fun recording. Like that part, I really enjoyed a lot. Uh, even though, again, the performing part of it was never really much my thing, but the programming part was, and also coming, like developing ideas, working up stuff, like from a conceptual point of view, that's what really got me. And what was your first impression of Bill? Uh, the first time I saw him play, I couldn't believe it. I mean, he was absolutely extraordinary, like just uh, I mean, I'd, I'd been around other musicians before, but I'd never seen anyone who had the kind of mastery that he did. And, you know, I was like, I, I was 18 at that point. So that meant that he would have been about 23, you know. So he was, he was that good at that point in time, and he only got better over the years. Mm. And did he already have that, you know, very um, experimental kind of pushing the envelope mentality at that point? Um, yeah, I would say so. Uh, he, it, it was interesting because he, he was very interested or seemed to be very interested in, in, I guess, conceptual stuff. And I, I know that he was fascinated with analyzing music and figuring out, I guess, kind of like figuring out how it all worked. Uh, sometimes he got it, sometimes he didn't, but you know, I think that at, at a certain point, we both became really fascinated with approaching the concept of, well, certain, making our own records from a conceptual point of view, but really kind of digging in much deeper than that. And, you know, the moniker material was adopted uh, at some point around then, maybe a little bit later. Um, what was the evolution of that? Uh, well, we were a band at first, uh, when we left Giorgio Gamelsky because he was essentially being our manager and we had kind of a falling out. Uh, we, be, we, we adopted the name material and then we sort of went off on our own. We went through a lot of personnel changes and eventually it came down to Bill and myself because all the other guys weren't in the band anymore. And, uh, there were various fallings out that went on. And we stopped being more of a group of people who played shows as like, you know, four piece, although we, we'd play shows from time to time and be joined by guys like Sonny Chirac 
and we work with a German named JT Lewis. And we would bring in other, you know, musicians from the New York scene. And we did we did tours from time to time, but mainly we started uh, concentrating more on being like a production team. Why do you think the players were so transient? You want my honest answer? Absolutely. This is truth and rhythm. <laughs> Well, I'm, you know, I'm, Bill was a control freak. You know, I mean, he really had to dominate the space that we were in. I, granted, he was, there's no question that he was the leader, but he was also very, he was very forceful about it. And it was pretty much his way or the highway. And if, I think his, the way he, he treated everyone in the group from more of a proprietary point of view, uh, and, you know, I think for some of the guys, it wasn't, that wasn't easy to, to manage. Uh, it was a little easier for me because, uh, I wasn't in a very good place mentally or emotionally at that point in time. So, uh, I think I was more manipulable. Um, what were some of the bands or trends going on around then that really had an impression on you and Bill? Um, a lot of the stuff that, that, that was interesting to us was, you know, I mean, it, it kind of, it changed over time. Like we, there, were, there was so much innovation going on at that point, but a lot of the stuff that I know I was listening to, and I, I know that Bill was as well, was stuff that was coming out of England. Like people were really pushing the envelope at that point in like the early 80s. Like when that when that metal box record came out by public image, I mean, that was like a game changer right there. Uh, it just, it was sort of like a juncture for so many different forms of music and no one had done anything quite like it before. I mean, it obviously touched a lot on like on dub music and, uh, and really shown a, a light on it as well that in a way that very few other I guess records of that time really did uh but there were a lot of there were a lot of other bands uh coming out of England at that time like this heat um and I mean obviously we were listening to you know people like Miles there was you know a lot of like off the wall jazz type stuff I mean it was really kind of all over the place and then of course we started getting into hip hop music and that changed everything right there. What was the first hip hop record that really kind of, you know, turned you on? Um, as far as hip hop goes, I mean, the first thing that I, that I heard that, that I, that I really enjoyed or that really made me go, wow, was probably the message. Hmm. Um, I think that came before Planet Rock? I'm not sure, because Planet Rock was after Numbers and, you know, by Kraftwerk. And Numbers really was sort of like, a, that was a major like transition for hip hop music in general, you know, because it went away from, before that, a lot of hip hop music had been guys taking tracks, like taking the backing track to Good Times and, you know, doing, you know, the, the Sugar Hill Gang taking that and making a song out of it, you know, but, with 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 numbers you basically had the beginning or some of the beginnings of like the whole electro movement and planet rock came out several months later or not not so like a short time after and obviously they'd incorporated bits of both numbers and trans europe express into that but that was a massive game changer in terms of how you could record a record, the instrumentation you could use, like the fact that the, it, it made things so much more DIY at that point. And it was homegrown at the same time, it was very exciting. And again, it was like nothing anyone had, had, had ever heard. It was almost like this great big feedback loop because obviously the beat to numbers is very informed by a lot of American and, and Black and African music in many respects. And 
you know, you had this, this loop of like that going over to Germany, them doing something with it, and then that coming right back to the States and someone taking that and extrapolating that. And it was really amazing to see this kind of like the feedback and the interchange of information and stuff. It was, it was incredible. It was, it, it was wonderful. It was wonderful to be a participant in that and just like watch it happen in real time. Yeah, I was going to say, Michael, it happened so fast once it, you know, hit the ground. I Ooh. mean, it was just spinning your head how fast they were coming and playing off each other. And I want to say the message, I think, was like 82. Um, and Planet Rock, I don't, I'm not sure either if it was 81 or 83. but Then Planet Rock would have been before. Then the message would have been after. I mean, that makes sense in the general timeline. Because hip-hop really wasn't being done with a lot of electronics as far as I as far as I recall before Planet Rock you know yep. but that was like the beginning of the whole electro scene right there I want to mention a few people that are very notable I mentioned them in the outset but um, that you worked with uh, related to material uh, before we move on from material and uh, just like Anona Hendrix you know what was your experience with her uh, well, we made two records with her. She was great. You know, she's extraordinary talent and a great singer and uh, a lot of fun to work with, too. Do you have any idea how that connection happened? Yeah, uh, we'd done a bunch of records where we used her as kind of like a featured guest. We did a single called Busting Out and we did a long playing record uh, called One Down and she sang on a couple of songs on that. And uh, when it came time for her to make a solo record, she'd gotten signed to RCA. She came to us and asked if we would do it. I love the way she's always seemed throughout her career just to be up for whatever, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I love that about her too. She's, she doesn't let a whole lot of things get in her way in that regard. And um, uh, Lenny White, how did that happen? I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember <laughs> no, I don't remember how it happened. I, I'm not sure. I think he may have reached out to us or something like that. I really don't know. Yeah. Do you remember anything about working with him? Um, yeah, I mean, he's, he's an amazing drummer. You know, the whole thing came together pretty quickly. Uh, I think he just wanted to see what it, he wanted, he wanted to try the whole situation on for size and see what it felt like. Yeah, he was jumping all over the place in the late 80s to, I mean, late 70s to early 80s uh, with funk and jazz and fusion and whatever. Um, yeah, yeah, he was. And uh, Brian Eno, who I know is probably was a big influence on you, right? Yeah, he was. Well, if you're growing up in the 70s and you're interested in electronic music and you have a a mind to go deeper than the prog rock stuff that I was also very interested in as well. You invariably wind up listening to Eno's stuff. So yeah, he was a, he was a big influence. Uh, and it was, it was an amazing experience, you know, being around him and seeing what his process, how, the different ways that he worked, what some of his processes were. And, you know, also, uh, working with him on, him on ambient music as well and seeing how that whole process kind of came together. Was his personality as quirky as his eclecticism um, musically? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I, I probably know more so than anyone else's. Uh, he's, a very, he's a very interesting guy, as you would, as you would imagine. And then the Herbie Hancock thing is what really helped launch you on the rest of your career, right? Yeah, I would say so. Absolutely. So what can you share with viewers about that experience and how that came together? Well, Herbie had reached out to us uh, some years prior to his, I think it was through Tony Myland, who was his assistant at the time. And Herbie had wanted to use Bill and Fred, who were our rhythm section, to play on uh, some tracks, you know. And uh, so they kind of made a very vague 
suggestion of a yeah maybe this will happen and then the whole thing evaporated and they we never heard from Herbie again after that and then about a year and a half later or so I think Mylant came back to us again and let us know that Herbie was interested that he was at the end of his uh, deal with Columbia and after that, they were going to hand him his walking papers. So he didn't really have a whole lot to lose at that point. He wasn't really getting anywhere with them. I think he wanted to be more of a pop artist. And he wasn't, he wasn't doing it. He wasn't successful at it. And that was going to be it. So they, they asked us if we would produce, compose and produce two songs. And we we're like, yeah, sure. This is very exciting, actually. And uh, so, yeah, that's, that's pretty much how that came together. And then the, the scratching technique, um, how did that, uh, you know, come into the fold? The song itself is rooted in hip hop. Obviously, it was based on beats that you could find to, you know, to a certain extent in hip hop and electro hip hop. And we were building more of an organic song out of it, but one that still had elements of hip hop music in it. And at that point in time, one of the key elements in hip hop music was using a turntable. So we were going to this place in New York, a lot called the Roxy with yeah. every Friday night, hip hop night, we were going there every Friday, just kind of checking out the vibe. And Laswell met this upcoming DJ, D DXT. Now he's DXT. Before then, he was DST. And he'd seen him perform, and he was like, wow, this guy's really good. So when it came time to do Rocket, he reached out to him and was like, we'd like you to perform on this piece of music. What was Herbie all on board from the get-go with the direction where it was going or was he a little reluctant? Uh, I don't think that Herbie knew what to expect until he actually heard the track that we created for him. And that was when we actually came to Los Angeles with it, finished without any of his keyboard parts. I don't think he had any idea what to expect at all. Uh, and I don't think that he knew what to make of it when he first heard it either. <laughs> were, were you guys uh, anxious about that at all? Or were you like, whatever? Not in the slightest. Uh, from Certainly from my perspective, this was going to be a win no matter what happened. Herbie was... Again, on his last legs, this was it. He wasn't going to make another record with Columbia. It's funny to say that now in hindsight. Uh, you know, so he didn't have any cards to play. No one had told us what they expected from us. So we had carte blanche. We could do whatever we wanted. And that was the basis on which we created the track. So when Herbie heard it, and mind you, he had from my at least from my understanding, no prior knowledge really of hip hop music or what it was, what it meant, what the significance was, any of the culture. So it was, I would say from judging by the reaction that I saw, it was more than a bit of a surprise to him when he first heard it. <laughs> you know, I, I felt like it had uh, picked up where he had left off in the late 70s. You know, if you take out like that few year stretch where he tried to do the pop R&B, easy, easy R&B stuff from the late 70s when he was doing more innovative stuff and trying more stuff and, and throwing different sounds in there and things like that. The leap to Future Shock was kind of like the natural progression to me more so than the other. Oh, I'm, I'm so pleased to hear you say that. Uh, because that was actually the spirit in which we created it. Uh, we would really tried to imagine what Herbie would have been doing if he hadn't 
attempted to make more commercial music. Uh, in fact, I, I'm in the process of finishing a book about, about making that. Uh, so it, that'll fill in a lot of blanks as well. Hmm. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, you, you picked up on something that's actually very intrinsic to, to Rocket, that it was made in, in many respects with that in mind. Yeah, well, he's one of my favorite artists among many, but um, love Herbie, especially um, that he took chances, you know. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, very much so. Well, he certainly took chances hiring a pair of upstarts like us. <laughs> so did you think there's any chance it was going to be a hit? And, and when it was, you know, what was your reaction? <laughs> um there wasn't a snowball's chance in hell that we thought it was going to be a hit. Uh, that was not on the table at all. Like, again, he'd hired us to like throw these tracks together. We basically saw this as an opportunity to put a whole bunch of conceptual stuff into practice and really kind of go off the rails. Like we'd been given, again, we'd been given carte blanche. It was like, we have this, legendary jazz jazz fusion keyboardist who has this amazing past working with miles davis and as a pioneer in electronic music and using electronic keyboards you know very cutting edge and here we are making this record now how in the name of all that's holy are you going to say that the, anything like that has it, even the slightest chance? And using hip hop, which at this point in time is not popular music as the foundation, how is there any possibility at all, just on the surface of it, going back to 1983, that you're going to get a hit record out of that? That much? None. <laughs> no. No one thought it was going to be a hit. Like, we were hopeful that people would be excited about it. The fact that we'd been invited back after those two tracks to finish the whole record was very uplifting to both of us, you know, because it meant, hey, someone likes what we did. And besides, they couldn't possibly find someone who would have been able to create tracks for the next solo record he was going to do that would have sounded like they fit on the same record with those two. I mean, they were just, they just stood out like sore thumbs, both of them. You know, so it was logical that they would get us to finish the record. But, you know, we had, the, it was a great affirmation to do it. But then, of course, we started hearing, oh, people really love this. Like, this is, what is this? And we'd also taken it to this guy, Tom Zutat, who is a very well-known a and person. He signed Guns N' Roses and Motley Crue later on. He was just, he was a young guy over at Electra at that point. And Electra had been our record label. Uh, and, you know, we just took it over to play for him. And he went nuts. Like, he just jumped up and he's like, I got to have that. And it was like, uh, it's already been, it's already on a record label. It's going to be released. You know, but his reaction was very, very like, wow, this is, this is cool. We may, you know, we may have something good, but as far as being a hit, no. Nah not a chance you know once the vid once once we saw the video and i have to say when i when i first saw that video i was i i was fit to be tired i was so upset <laughs> you know because it's just it, like back then music videos were so new and i was still in a state where i would vi i kind of visualized or had kind of like a mental picture of what a piece of music meant to me and certainly the ones that I'd worked on. So Rocket to me was like, that was, you know, again, it's, it's an extension of Herbie's lineage. I mean, some of it's revisionist from our point of view and some of it's real from his actual history, but being a continuation of that, his collision, the collision of that with hip hop music, that was a big deal. That's how I saw it. And to me, that was like more of a really like serious cultural event instead of this like party with these like, you know, bouncing robots and toothpaste squirting all over Mannequins. the place, you know? Yeah. And yeah, and, and like quirky, quirky English kind of like uh, 
I mean, you, you look at the video and it's like, this looks like Great Britain. It has nothing to do with, with America or, you know, or, 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 you know, American culture or, or hip hop or, you know, any of that stuff or Herbie even, even though he's in the video a little bit. So I was like furious. <laughs> and then of course the video starts taking off and I'm kind of like, oh, oh, okay. That's, that's not bad. I think I like the video now. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's a fascinating story. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so after that did hit and you were shocked, um, how did that start to propel you toward, you know, your own life as a producer? Uh, well, you know, we started to be kind of like the new kids on the block as a production team. We won like the Rolling Stones critics poll for like best producer of 1983. And at that point I was kind of like, whoa, wait a minute, what's going on? Like, this is crazy. I, I wasn't expecting this. And unfortunately the inevitable happened and you know, then I got kicked out of material. So I was like, Lazo was sort of like the last guy standing at that point. He kind of wanted the, I think he wanted the accolades and he didn't want to share. So. I got the boot and I had to go out on my own. I, and in fairness, like by saying that, that's, I, I want to make it very clear that I'm actually incredibly grateful that that happened because if I hadn't, if I hadn't been booted, uh, I would have stayed. And I don't think that that would have gone too well, but more importantly, I'm very grateful for the fact that I was able to to go on and do other things, so I'm 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 happy that that happened. It worked out really well. Well, uh, as a music fan, I'm happy too. You know how it worked out for sure. And <laughs> what uh, what was the path, Michael, that uh, you know connected you to the Red Hot Chili Peppers? Uh, well, honestly, after Material, I just had no idea what to do. I mean, I was just completely lost. I worked with a couple of bands in, uh, up in Canada. Coincidentally enough, I'm here now. Uh, but in the States, like if you work with a band in Canada, like people in the American music industry, to them, that was almost as if you'd never done a record at all. And at that point, everyone associated Rocket and Future Shock and pretty much the entire material catalog with Laswell. So... I essentially had to start over from scratch because at times I couldn't even convince people that I'd worked on Rocket. It was really funny. Like if they didn't have the label copy, they just sort of be looking at me like, you didn't do that. <laughs> and there was no internet. So I couldn't say, just Google it, please. You know, uh, so I just started making the rounds of A&R people. And I wasn't particularly up to the task because I was really insecure at that point. You know, so I was very nervous and shy and I didn't have my uh, I didn't have the, the platform of Herbie's record, uh, you know, to, to really kind of work from. So I just had to go and sell myself. And it was really very sobering, actually, like a really amazing experience. So one day I take a meeting with a guy named Michael Barrickman over at EMI Records and I give him my usual song and dance. And he's like, I may have something for you. <laughs> he's like have you ever heard of the red hat chili peppers and i was like uh yeah yeah sure i have <laughs> so he sends me home with a demo with three songs on it which i listened to and it it wasn't that great and then i started listening to it more and i realized that there was something really unique there that I hadn't really experienced before, but it wasn't so much in the music. There was something about the personality of who these guys were that was coming across in this really strange kind of otherworldly way. And I was like, no, 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 wait a sec, wait a sec. This is actually really interesting. Like the music isn't so great, but there's something, something in there that if it's exploited, if we can get to it, this could be amazing. And I got really excited and I, I went back to Barrickman and I was like, I'm, a, I'm down, I'm down, I'm down. I want to meet with these guys, you know, and that's kind of where that whole started, whole thing started. 
What was your first meeting with the band like? Uh, they were, I met them on, while well, they were on tour. They were playing a show at Tipitina's in New Orleans. And uh, where I'd never been before. And I went down there uh, and saw them play. And I just never seen anything like it before. You know, watching these guys with in their underwear kind of jump around on the stage, <laughs> just banging away at their instruments and playing them very well. But at the same time, it was just like there's a bombast and yelling and shouting and, you know, whatever. And after, you know, after a few minutes, I was like, this is kind of tedious, actually. But then I started to look around me and go, wait a minute. Like, this is exciting. Like, the whole place is like, going crazy with these guys and everyone knows the lyrics to all these i mean you can't really call them songs at that point whatever they are pieces or whatever there isn't a whole lot of singing but they've managed to like suck this entire audience into what it is that you're doing this is actually really exciting and again i'm thinking to myself there's a lot of potential here like really untapped but extraordinary potential and I you know at the end of the show obviously we met we went out for some food and then I got in their van with them the next day and I drove with them to their next gig in Dallas uh and we got to know each other on the on the on the road that way and this was what year I mean because they already had their debut album out and had they already done the freaky styly or no yeah they'd already freaky styly had already come out this was this would have been 1986. This was in October, November, I think. And uh, yeah, it was actually I, I was told that it was me and Mick Jones from The Clash was the other guy who was in the running to produce it. Okay, that's, not, chop, that's not chopped liver. No, in hindsight, I think that they may have wanted Mick Jones to produce it. It doesn't mean that they that they had actually gotten to him. Uh, I know that they'd gotten to Laswell actually and to Rick Rubin and they both turned them down. Hmm. Well, you know, when I first heard them and heard their debut um, and I being from Los Angeles, I got to see them numerous times play, you know, with just the body paint the, and, and the socks and their cocks only, you know, it's just crazy. But being a fan of, of funk and rock, you know, I really dug what they were going after, you know, and plus they were so influenced by George Clinton and all that. And I'm a huge fan of that. So it worked oh, yeah. for me, but you know, they were definitely rough around the edges. There's no question about that. Yeah. Well, that's part of what made them so great. You yeah. know, that, that roughness. I mean, they were, one of the things that I loved about them was they kind of typified an aspect of existence, I guess, that they're, they're just, they represented so many elements that can't possibly be reconciled. You know, I mean, as human beings, we're constantly looking for ways to, recon to reconcile all kinds of contradictory ideas and things. And they just, it, 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 there were so many things about them, like the way that they put things together and made them work in the same space without diluting anything. The fact that you could have people playing punk and funk together in a song and make it sound believable, you know, the fact that they were, you know, really sensitive people, but at the same time, they're completely nihilistic, you know, it was, it, it was a lot of fun to work with that kind of energy, but also to kind of make something that was more, that, that kind of coalesced more and came together more, because I did feel that their first two records really kind of were the sum of their influences more than greater than the sum of their parts. I felt that they just didn't, they hadn't created a group sound per se, that it was more, that it was eclecticism for its own sake, even though they obviously loved all the music that they were influenced by, they hadn't found a way to kind of bring it all together. And I guess do the impossible of re reconciling the irreconcilable. There's much more to this great Truth and Rhythm interview. Just continue on to the next part of the episode. Also, be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. And become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you very much.
Thank you.